more, don't ask for more money because we are all in this together to fight for the cause. So the power of the union immediately was diminished. Maybe it should have been. I'm not suggesting that people shouldn't support the country. That's not the point. But they didn't want to stand up and say, we won't work, we won't fight, or we, we'll, we're going to fight against you, we're going to shut you down, because they knew that they were playing part of a, a role in something much bigger. And so they accepted low wages, they accepted a lot of the conditions. So the concept of union, real union, got put on hold. Even by the Molly McGuire's, when did they come in? <laughs> the Molly McGuire's, I don't remember the year of Molly McGuire's. 1870s, Molly, I think. I'm yeah. sorry? 1870s, I think. 1871, 72, something yeah. like that. Yeah, so it's a little bit later. But the Molly McGuire's, I don't think, worry about much of anything other than trying to spread their, their vision. Well, I've heard of one Welsh coal miner who started in Pennsylvania with a contract for one of the big railroads coming over uh, back in 1865. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, he was burnt out of there and with his own family ran some coal mines for him. So he, he had a contract to take with him, like that first family mine. Mm -hmm. So 1864, well, that was the American Miners Association. 1864, another group tried to form, because that one pretty much died out, the Working Men's Benevolence Society. Um, and it didn't last terribly long. Um, but when it died, the whole concept of building a union became much more prominent in the minds of workers. Uh, because they did have some organization and some sense of how this might work. Next, please. Uh, 1869, you've probably all heard of the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor was a very secretive group that met, um, and their, their concept was to build a union very quietly because if, what would happen to you if you tried to promote the idea of union openly? Do you think people would come up and say, no, 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 you shouldn't do that? No, you could be killed. You could be beaten. Your family could be threatened. Corporations didn't like the concept of union. And they had power and money, and you didn't. So the uh, Knights of Labor were founded. It was highly secretive for the first uh, 10 years of it, it, its existence, or a good share of those years. Uh, it gained quite a bit of membership. It was quite popular. Um, unfortunately, it came under the leadership of a man named Terence B. Powderly, who, in my opinion, was much more concerned with his own power than he was the real needs of the Union, and that was part of the downfall. But the other part is that the uh, Knights believed that you should try to do everything humanly possible before you strike. And they wouldn't support strikes amongst the workers, and the workers were tired of just giving in over and over and over. They wanted something to happen. So, 1873, John Siney, quite a big name in the labor movement, called together the Miners National Association of the United States of America. Now this comes into play for me with what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, uh, because at this time, a young man by the name of Chris Evans has arrived in this country. And he's working in Pennsylvania, he has become a member of the Knights of Labor, but he's also actively involved in the Miners National Association and starts rising up through the ranks. Um, and so he's, he's getting both sides of this issue. He's got the Knights of Labor, let's not strike, let's try to be reasonable. And one of the nice things about the Knights of Labor was they believed in educating people. They spent, a, a lot of these workers spent their time in the evenings coming and being trained on how to speak properly, how to write, uh, reading uh, materials that would help them to become more astute about, uh, about economics and all that sort of thing. So, uh, so he's getting the education, he's seeing the one side of the view and he's hearing the miners who say we can't go on like this, we, we've got to strike, we've got to be willing to stand up and fight because that's the only way we're going to get anywhere. Um, the Knights because they maintained that view, a lot of their, their members were pretty unhappy with them. And 
By 1883, many of them had broken away and formed what was called the Amalgamated Association of Miners of the United States. This, this only lasted three years, so here it is ten years later and they're trying again. And um, again, it was a reaction to the, uh, the Knights not being willing to struck. Well, right here in southeastern Ohio, we entered into what was called uh, the, Hock the Great Hocking Valley Mine Strike. And this was led by Chris Evans, who had moved here in 1877. He and John McBride from Massillon, Ohio, had tried to lead the movement. Actually, John uh, McBride was a major player in developing this union. Um, they felt it was time to stand up and fight. Okay, next. Uh, uh, some other unions I'm going to just run through very quickly and we'll talk about the 84 and 85 mine strike. Uh, the National Federation of Miners and Mine Laborers, that happened right after this mine strike and you'll see why in a minute. Then the National Trade Assembly number 135, this was the Knights attempt to control the miners. They formed a union specifically for the miners rather than all the trades that had previously been there and it was an attempt to pull the miners back from these other organizations that they disliked and get them under their control again. Um, it was fought fiercely um, and then finally the group that uh, had affiliated around McBride and, and uh, Chris Evans and those folks formed what was called the National Progressive Union of Miners. And what they were essentially saying is we're tired of trying to talk to the Knights of Labor and get them involved with us. They don't want it. They don't want to be involved. We're going to form our own union and forget this idea of being united. Well, as soon as they did that, many of the Knights of Labor folks said, well, we'd rather be with a union that's going to do stuff with than with the one that just talks a lot. So the, the membership in the Knights of Labor diminished significantly. They finally gave in <coughs> and they merged and that the, the Knights of Labor 135 and the NPU joined together and that's when the United Mine Workers of America started. Okay, let's go back to or to the next one, please. Um, that's the United Mine Workers. Next, please. One more. Okay, this is uh, Chris Evans. He's the reason I keep coming to him is he's a southeastern Ohio person. He came here. He came to this country in 1869 uh, from uh, England. He was at his father was Welsh. His mother was English. He came over to Pennsylvania in 1869, worked there for a while, was sent down uh, on behalf of the Union to help get money to send back to settle a strike back in, uh, or not settle, but to feed miners while they were striking back in Pennsylvania. He came here in 1875 for that, liked it so much here, and felt that the, the people in this country were ready for a Union. He moved here in 1877 to stay over in New Straitsville. Okay. John McBride was a uh, partner, uh, did, lots of, I mean, did lots of things with him, and uh, the two of them were major players in the labor movement in the state. Um, so, the first thing he did was set up the Knights of Labor 120 in New Straitsville. He still, at that point, was supporting the Knights of Labor, and they set up another union in Shawnee, and I can't remember the number of it, and he led the 1884-85 mine strike. It, it was part of the state union that had been formed. Uh, McBride was the president, but McBride got sick, and uh, Chris Evans essentially ran this strike. Okay, next, please. Here's how it happened. Workers, you've, we've talked about what workers had to do. All right, They're being paid 70 cents a ton to do all that stuff that we talked about. Now, back in those days, 70 cents a ton was not all that bad. <coughs> There was no guarantee you were going to get eight hours of work a day. You might work for 16 hours a day for many days, and you might not have any work for weeks or months sometimes. So it's not quite as good as it might sound. But the company was feeling like they weren't making enough profit. So the first thing they do is say, we want you workers to take 60 cents a ton. Now think of taking one-seventh of your pay away and saying, you can do that. No problem. In fact, would you all give me one seventh of your pay, please? <laughs> I think that's a great deal for me. I like it. All right, you're not going to do that. All right, so 
um, the workers said, we can't even feed our families on what we got now. How are we going to do this when you give us less money? Well, they said, no, we can't accept that. We think you should go to the railroads and ask them to give you a cut in what they're charging you to transport the, the coal. They're charging you too much. Why take it out of us? Um, <coughs> finally, the companies just shut their doors and said, okay, we don't want any of you, you're all out, and we're going to try to bring in what are called scabs or black legs. We're going to get people from outside this area to come in and work at the prices we're willing to pay them. If you don't like it, too bad. Okay? Well, you, you can imagine how the, the miners are going to take that. Oh, we'll just stand aside and let these people come in and take our jobs. Of course, when you're fired from the mines, you're thrown out of your house, by the way. You're given notice that you've got to be out of the house by the end of the day, and all your stuff, if you don't have it out of your, out of your house, the, the goons from the company are going to come in and put it out on the street, and you and your family are going to be out on the street. Okay? No job. Um, a lot of people during this thing had to live up in the hills in tents and under little brush um, houses that they made, put together out of brush and things like that. <coughs> Um, and they started striking. Now, Evans and uh, McBride were not fans of violence and did not support it or encourage it, or at least that's what history says, and I want to believe that from what I've read about these guys and understood about them, I think that's probably true. But that didn't mean that those things didn't happen. There's a place called the Bristol Tunnel that was like a very long tunnel over there beyond New Straitsville, and somebody set it on fire. And the reason they did that is that kept the trains from getting into where the mines were to get the coal. Okay, you don't want to let us work. You're not going to take any coal out of here. Okay? You want to bring in your black legs? Fine. We'll shoot them. We'll threaten them. We'll beat them. We'll do whatever we have to to protect our jobs. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that McBride or uh, Evans supported that, but those are things that happen. Mysteriously, in the middle of the night, you might be sleeping in your house, and if you were a, a supervisor or somebody who was supportive of the mine owners, you might find a stick of dynamite come rolling down the hill and blow up, blow the, the front part of your house off while you're sleeping in it. It happened. You might find that parts of your mind get blown up. Gee, I don't know how that happened. It was the only way these people could fight back, or at least how they perceived it. This went on, and of course, what the <coughs> operators did, they hired the Pinkerton detectives. Now, doesn't that sound like a, a very nice group of people? Pinkerton <laughs> detectives, well-educated, thoughtful people who are going to go investigate, right? The Pinkerton detectives, like the Baldwin Felt detectives and many others, were nothing more than a bunch of thugs that could be hired for a very low price who just got great enjoyment out of beating people up and shooting them. And the company said, go beat them up, go shoot them, do whatever you got to do, but keep those union people out of our minds. And, that, and, excuse me, and that's what they did. So you've got open warfare. This is happening in southeastern Ohio. Um, finally, by February of 1885, this went on from June 1884 to February 1885, the miners had been starved out. There was no more food. Chris Evans did superhuman efforts to go around to other unions and anybody who had any money and bring in loads of food and clothing and shelter to take care of the miners in southeastern Ohio, but there were just too many, too many kids starving to death. Stuff like that. Finally, in 80, 1885, the miners gave up and went back to work. So it sounds like they lost. Well, in that instance, they did. However, there was a big investigation that took place in 1885 by the state of Ohio. And what it did do was give both sides the opportunity to voice their complaints, which did cause some legislators to become open to the idea of more safety, it uh, helped people to finally vote against the idea of people being paid in script. They had to be paid in cash and not just once a month, but every two weeks, and a number of things, some of which 
weren't followed, but they were put into place. Um, and it did energize a lot of people to say, union is the only hope we have. Because obviously they have a great deal of power, the operators. Okay, next please. Okay, um, Chris Evans, after that, went on to play a major role in this country in lots of ways. Um, he was at just about every major convention that you can imagine where coal miners and coal miners' rights came up. And he helped establish what is called the Pittsburgh Scale of Prices. What he said was, why can't operators and workers get together, work together, and set up prices that we all think are fair and we charge everybody? Sounds pretty reasonable, right? And so, for about four years, this worked. Um, they set prices. So if you work here in southeastern Ohio, we have this kind of coal and this ability to get at it, et cetera, et cetera. And over in this part of the country, it's a different set of circumstances. So in this part of the country, you get paid this. Over here, you get paid that. And if every mine owner and every worker abided by that, you know exactly what you're going to get. Fair play, right? Great idea, it lasted for about four years. Also believed in the idea of arbitration. If you've got a problem, let's not go killing each other. Let's not beat each other. Let's, let's go to a board made up of members of the miners and members of the uh, operators and see if we can come to a reasonable agreement on it. Uh, this was so popular that when he, the first convention that he went to, he was elected president of the convention even though there were far fewer miners in the room than there were operators because he was very well respected. This was his great gift. Um, so he, he uh, promoted this idea, and it would have been great, except that what happens? Some operators said, well, if you're, only gonna, if you're going to charge those prices, I can undercut your price, and I can make more money than you. So, what happens to those companies that agree to these prices? They can't survive anymore because their, their competition is outdoing them. And the, and the uh, miners who felt that they could get more money um, or would work for less money could simply come in and say, I'll work for less money, and many operators would let them do it. So it just undermined this whole thing. The, one of the things that I, I like about Chris Evans, and I think is valuable, as he did, I think, ultimately believe there needed to be a political so, a solution. He was a Republican um, in a day when Republican meant something very different from what we talk about today, but um, <laughs> he was a Republican. He uh, did run for state Congress because he and friends like Niall Heisel and John McBride, uh, those two guys, got into state politics and did have some impact on changing the laws. <coughs> Uh, safety rules and things like that for miners. He ran, he lost, unfortunately, very badly against uh, another Republican. Uh, one of the things that uh, I like about him is he was very conscious of the other people in the community. Um, he was not one of those people who hated black people. He was not one of those people who hated uh, Slavic people. Or And there was a lot of that that went on in those days. A lot of hatred of people who were other or different. Um, he was very open to working with people. He accepted women in the union. He accepted the idea. He worked very closely with a number of African Americans and uh, was very supportive of them in their attempts to uh, be free of the kinds of things that were going on in this country. Okay, next please. All right, some things about his personal life. I'm not going to go into that very much. But he, in 1889, he um, this is the kind of man he was. He uh, was the secretary and president. He was the secretary of the National Progressive Union. He was president of District Number 10 in Ohio. And in that same year, when his wife died in his in childbirth with the, with their last child, he was elected secretary of the American Federation of Labor. And he did all of these things amidst all this personal calamity in his life, and did it very effectively. Uh, so, he worked under Samuel Gompers uh, in the American Federation of Labor. He finally retired in uh, 1909 and wrote the history of the United Mine Workers of America. 
during his time after he left the American Federation of Labor, he was one of those guys who went out and worked for the union, both the AFL and the United Mine Workers. He was over in Homestead. You all know about Homestead, the Homestead Strike. He was out in uh, Colorado and uh, dealing with the strikes out there. And uh, what's the name of the Ludlow. 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 He was in Ludlow, but before before the big Ludlow massacre, he was in, out there in the 19, early 1900s. Um, he traveled around and dealt with many many issues for laborers in this country. He went into uh, West Virginia. Oh, there were I think three three African Americans uh, who were murdered in their beds. There was uh, there was a mine strike down there. And uh, the sheriff tried to break them up, and the miners all stood up to the sheriff and chased him away. Well, he didn't, wasn't going to settle for that. So he organized a posse, and they went and rounded up 48 white men and took them off to jail. And then they rode off to the camp where the African Americans lived and just opened fire on their cabins, firing against women, children. Um, and killed three African-American men, wounded a number of others pretty, pretty seriously. Uh, Chris Evans went down there to investigate and report it and talked about the ugliness of this. He actually tried to bring the sheriff before the courts in West Virginia, got him indicted. Uh, they, he and the union paid for legal uh, fees to, to fight this guy and try to get him put in prison for what he did. And uh, I don't know how much you know about West Virginia politics, but back in those days, early 1900s, you know who ran the West Virginia uh, legislators, legislation? Coal mine owners. Still do. You, <laughs> still do. I, I wasn't going to say that. Uh, you can draw your own conclusions about today, but guess what? Dan Cunningham, the sheriff, got off scot-free. Three men gave their lives. They were shot trying to get out of their beds. One had one shoe on, uh, one was still in his underwear, the other one, I don't remember what the situation was, but they were clearly not in a position where they were firing. Now one of the African Americans from another cabin did fire off a shot, and they used that as their excuse to just attack wantonly and kill people. So this is what people were up against. Yes, sir. I'm just curious about the, uh, we're talking about the, the union movement, the, like a precursor to the, to the Wobblies, the IWW, is that, yes. was, there, was there any like uh, ideology surrounding the unions uh, or any like revolutionary potential or were people just simply fighting for a better life? I think in Southeastern Ohio, uh, the power, uh, there were some Wobblies here. Uh, but I think they're very small in numbers. Uh, it's hard to tell how many people consider themselves communists or socialists or anything like that. I would say that this crowd that was the earth, that were the early movers and shakers in the uh, United Mine Workers were a pretty conservative bunch. Chris Evans was not against capitalism. They did not feel that they wanted to take down the concept of, of capitalism. They just said, now, is it fair that you, Mr. Operator, go home to your mansion and your servants and your children can go to Europe and go to school, and my children sit on a dirt floor and we have barely enough to eat? Isn't there something wrong with this picture? So that was their main, the people I'm talking about. The Wobblies, you're going to hear, this gentleman right here is going to do a talk next month, and you're going to get a lot about the Wobblies. Uh, but the Wobblies <laughs> were around at this time uh, and were becoming... Uh, pretty well known. Um, you had people like Mother Jones who were out promoting. Mother Jones early on was into the Wobbly movement. She kind of moved away from it. Um, and she and Chris Evans got arrested in West Virginia for trying to help the miners. Um, so they knew each other. Um, so this group, not so much, but the there, this was building. I mean, he was around, these people were around when the Haymarket affair happened in 1896, and uh, 
Many of the workers tried to get the American Federation of Labor to write a statement in support of those people and, said, and, and so they wouldn't get hanged. Samuel Gompers pretty much said, we don't want to deal with the radicals. And I, that's the one thing I have against Chris Evans. I've never found anything where he personally stood up and said, yes, we should. And John L. Lewis was supported FDR twice in the Rose Point, Michigan, which was until they were unclaimed. So, Dr. Lewis, we have five more minutes. I'm sorry? Five more minutes. Five more minutes? Okay. So essentially, um, do I have another slide? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the legacy of coal in southeastern Ohio. Today, a lot of people who come here know very little about it. There are very few remnants that you can find unless you're really looking for them. Remember those early pictures I showed you of the tipples and all that sort of thing? This was the Millfield Mine back in the 1960s. This is what was left of that big, beautiful building we saw a picture, a nice clean looking building that we saw earlier. That's now all gone. Part of this building is still standing and then the tower is all that's left. Next please. Um, we have a lot of crumbling towns. Any of you been over in Gloucester lately? Mm -hmm. Ever been over in Lurig? Kimberly? Carbondale? Um, and there are uh, Broadwell, lots of communities like that that just are a blight on the landscape now because of the destruction of coal. When the operators had sucked everything they could out of this land, they went away. And they took all the money with them. Next. And so we were left with mine runoff pollution destruction of the landscape, a lot of stripped land that needed to be uh, uh, preserved and redone, uh, poverty. I think all of you see a, it could, could very well make the case that we see a general mistrust of government and big business and outsiders in general in this area. Uh, we see a continuation of the slave, uh, wage slave mentality. This is what we're trying to get back to, folks. I'm sorry to tell you if I seem too radical, but this is what's going on. Companies are saying, let's give workers less. Let's not give them uh, 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 medical support. Let's take away their benefits. Let's cut their salaries. And let's do more with less. You heard that one before? <laughs> do more with less. And yet, what's happening at the corporate level? They're making uh, astounding amounts of money, more money than in profit than they've ever made before. And you're being told, do with less. We're not going to pay you benefits anymore. You're going to pay for your own insurance. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that. It is not over. Great power inequality, and. When will it end? Only when people in this country do what the miners had to do, which was to stand up and say, we're not going to take it anymore. We've got to do something together, because alone we're doing nothing. So um, I think it stands as a real good example of learning from the past about what's <laughs> going on now. And if you just wait for it all to get OK, it's not going to happen. Okay. Or if you wait for Mr. Kasich to solve your problems. <laughs> okay, I would be happy to answer any questions. why unions have failed is because certain people got more carried away with their own personal greed than with helping workers. Yes, sir. There was a UNW office some years ago, I don't, I'm not from that, so like next to the farms. Is it still owned by the UNW or do they sell it off? That's a great question. I don't know that. But that would be interesting to find out. I think that was from it. It was why? I think they were. I think they were. Okay, yes. Um, this is just more of a 
well, an actual question, but one of the photography professors here actually has an exhibit at Marietta College comparing the post-industrial coal landscapes of Scranton, Pennsylvania with Wales. So if anyone is interested in sort of this post, uh, you know, post, post coal landscape thing, it's a really cool exhibit at Marietta College. Thank you. From right behind. I know some of you probably have classes or appointments, but um, I'm happy to stay and talk with anyone who wants. Do we have time to do that, or do we have to close up? Oh, yes, up? we have the room for a little bit. We're going to start cleaning up. OK. Um, but, and there's um, a little bit of a uh, couple of cookies left. There's some <laughs> cider if you'd like to do so. We have gifts for you. Oh, bless you.